So I'm going to be looking today at um, project, rolling roll project on Morick Village. And I think that apart from Claire's own projects, we probably know more about Morick Village, Village project than any of the other rolling roll projects because Claire and I found quite a lot of materials in the archive when we went up about this project. And we also have Dorothy talk a little bit on one of the rolling roll videos. She talks about it quite a lot. Um, and it was done in 1985-86 by three teachers in a school, uh, Davison, Cochrane and Berwick. And Dorothy called them the Jarrow Three presumably because they were working in a school in Jarrow. So you have in Rolling Roll, you have these three domains. That was Dorothy's idea. You start with three domains when you're planning it and you have an arts domain and a science domain and a history domain and they overlap. Um, obviously within any one domain, you know, you might be looking at something with history involved, but there also could be science elements in that. So it's not kind of pure, but I think maybe part of her idea was, okay, rolling roll would break down the sort of separation of subjects in the secondary school, particularly, and would get teachers working together and classes working together. And she didn't like this division between the arts and the sciences and the humanities as different ways of knowing. So maybe part of it was about trying to bring these different ways of knowing together and drama kind of becomes the glue or the joint that brings it together. So you have the three domains and you have in the middle of it, you have a point of change. So you create a community. In this case, it was a fictional community called Morick Village. And something is happening that's a point of change in that community that um, is the focus for the whole thing that brings everything together. So it's all related in some way to this point of change. So this is what this group set up initially, I think, for their plan. They had the manor house in the village, Chalana Hall. And here they also say we're going to have one domain, which is about the village itself, where they're saying it's a settled rural community with a new housing development on the outskirts of the village. And they were also planning a third domain, which is a fresco festival, an ancient fresco in the church, which is very old, dates back to Norman times, and, but it's in bad condition. So it has to be protected and it's only shown every 10 years. And this is, there's a festival coming up for that. That seems to be what they planned with because it's not actually what they did. What we have and what I'll share with you is you have planning charts, which it seems the teachers produced for the project. And there you have one domain is actually about, well, the point of change here is that the China Hall house, manor house, is going to be converted to a hotel. That's the big change in the village. And there's actually one strand of work, one domain, which is about, all about, taking this house and turning it into a hotel. There's another domain, another strand of work, which is all about um, the discovery of a skeleton in one of these temple follies that you get in these manor houses and um, there's a discovery some workmen are working on them repairing the mausoleum floor and they discover a skeleton and it dates back to um the late 1790s it's um there's a whole story there about what happened how that body was buried secretly it was kind of like a Taj Mahal in honor of this woman who died, who was married to the owner of the hall. And that becomes another strand. And then there's a third strand, which is to do with local legends and tales of the manor house. 
And in fact, um, here, yes, one point of change is the house to the hotel conversion. But I think actually another point of change becomes this discovery of this skeleton and the after effects of that. You can see in this plan, they also had something about a Saxon long barrow folly. Um, but this was never used, I don't think, never developed. There's sort of things here that I think, um, well, Claire, I know you did some of these things. You had a fresco in one project, you had a Saxon long barrow in another. So maybe it comes from you or comes from Dorothy's own obsessions or interests, those kind of things. But as I say, they were developed. Um, here you have, this is something in some notes that were produced by this Jarrow 3. And it's got, um, so you've got the three domains, you've got the overlap, you've got the point of change. And there's something there that I hadn't seen before in any of these charts, which is the idea of some kind of tension point or strand of tension within each of these domains. I hadn't seen that before. Now, Dorothy was always sort of changing her models and ways of working. So um, this may be something she put in at one point and then it didn't appear again. Um, I don't know if it's something that you recognize, Claire, at all. No, I think that's the first time I've ever seen it, yeah. Yeah, and I kind of think, well, I've looked at it and thought, okay, let's follow that through and let's see what would the tension points be in these domains? Because after all, Dorothy would say there needs to be a productive tension in anything that you're doing, in any drama that you're doing, that um, binds the group together, that gives this edge to everything you're doing. And so it makes logical sense that there would be a point of tension. And uh, this seems to suggest that there's a tension element running through each of the domains. So what would that be? So that's what I've been thinking about and looking at. So here you have, a map that was used of Morrick Village. And you can see Chalana Hall on the left there and the hotels and the sh shops and so on. Now, I'm gonna share these charts that the teachers produced, but from, what, from hearing Dorothy talk, it seems to me that there were other things that were done as part of this project, which are not in these plans. I'm not sure exactly how it works. Uh, Dorothy talks, for example, about uh, one class working on some kind of mystery in the graveyard. There's a lot of material for this project and a lot of different elements to it. But um, it may be that Dorothy was working with some groups and the teachers with other groups, I'm not sure. So here is one of these charts. And I like, I like this chart and I th I'm thinking of using it with our partners on the Rolling Roll project, because it seems to me it's clear. It's clear in setting out the different elements. So you have um, the material that the teachers have produced or that the classes have produced. You have the name of the class, you have frame, what is their role and frame distance as well. I quite like the fact that it talks about what is the frame distance. It outlines the tasks and it outlines the product, what is the outcome. And then it uh, looks at, okay, it says, where does it go? Where does this material that's produced go? So this is the domain about um, the, the bones, paper bones, the skeleton that is found. That starts by the builders finding it and they tell their story to a local reporter, which is the teacher in the role, who compiles a news report about what they found. And then that is passed. The bones and the newspaper report are passed to police trainees who look at these materials and produce a report about what they think happened. The paper bones, the police report, go to a team of forensic scientists who have to examine the evidence and draw conclusions, and they write a report. And then you have uh, the bones, the police report, the forensic report, 
go-to national reporters who are following up the story and trying to write a report about it. And then this goes to, um, I think it's guides within the property. So people who are guides, like national trust guides to the property, they know that there's going to be people, visitors coming to the site who want to see where this body was discovered and know all about the story. So these people are guides and they have to look at all these different reports and quickly get an idea of what they should tell visitors when they come to find out more about this discovery. And then it goes, this goes to, you have participants who reenact um, the night. You're now back to sort of participant role. They are villagers in the wood who were there on the night when the body was um, buried there. And what did they see? So that's the, that's that strand of work. And in terms of a tension and a productive tension, you can obviously see that the body, the mystery of the body, the mystery of why it was buried in this folly, that is the strand of tension that's running through it. That's clear, I think, that's very clear, that that's the tension point. And this, this is the, domain concerned with the transfer of the or conversion of the hall into a hotel. So you have, and I'll take us through this in more detail, but you begin with a memo from the personnel department of the hotel who want to know what staff will be needed to run the hotel. So they've asked other people within the personnel department to come up with job descriptions. They come up with the job descriptions and this is then passed to job center workers who produce uh, job cards to display in the job center, advertising the different jobs and the skills that will be needed. These job cards are then passed to, according to this plan, are passed to the next group of villagers who want jobs in the hotel. So they write letters, application letters. And then the next group in this plan are people who, the personnel department, who are selecting and interviewing the candidates. So I, I'm, it seems to me that these charts were drawn up by the teachers doing the project. And I'm assuming that each teacher was in charge of one of these strands. So one teacher would have been doing this work about the hotel another teacher was doing the work on the skeletons. Seems to me that that would be the way it went. Um, but as we'll see, um, Dorothy's idea for this way this work would go was actually different. It was more complicated, there were more twists to it. It was deeper, I think, than this chart shows. So, but I'm interested here that I'm assuming this is written by one of the teachers and the frame distance in each case is put as participant. And I'm not sure that it is participant in each case. So I'll just go over frame distance because well, we've talked about it before, but um, some of you may not have been there and um, it's always good to revisit it anyway. So frame distance, what are we talking about? So Dorothy came up with these, this idea that there are different positions that the children might take in relation to any event. So they might be the participant in an event. So here's the participant. I'm here, it is happening to me. It is being right, you're right in the middle of it. The next frame was is the frame of a guide or a witness to an event i saw the event i can relive it and show you what happened i can be your guide to the event so the children who were the builders who found the body were well, first of all it's happening to them because they're finding the body but then they have to tell the journalists about what happened and so they become the guide to it 
So then you have the agent. I must help you to understand the event. And the authority, who's somebody like a, like a judge, for example, who has to make sensible decisions about the possible result uh, arising from such events, like a judge um, deciding that somebody should be punished. You then have, I'm the critic of such events. I compare this event with others and give you my reasons, opinions, and explanations. And somebody who researches the event in order to throw new light upon it now that time has passed. You have the press or the story keeper. I was not there, but I will share with you what I've come to understand. You have another frame where you record the event because you're responsible to those who will ask what really happened. And then you finally you have the artist who studies the event and is moved to reinterpret the event to create a new perception of it. So I mean, I'm looking at this at the moment. One of the things about these frames, frame distances, is that she talks about if you have a very extreme or dramatic event, the example she uses is the Good Samaritan. These are all images based on the Good Samaritan. Very dramatic event. But if children were to act that out, it would, it would not be really very convincing. Uh, so if there were participants in that, it's, there's another example, which is um, a plane crash and children wanted to do a plane crash. And if they were participants in the plane crash, then it wouldn't be very real for them, really. It wouldn't be very convincing. They would um, probably just scream. And because it's so difficult for anybody to really, you'd have to do a lot of work, preparation work to get into that sort of situation, believably. But if you take a step back and if you're a guide to an event or you're a recorder, Dorothy actually believed that you could get closer to the heart of the event by just taking that one step away from it. You could actually get really to understand or to recognize sort of the horror of a, of a violent assault or a plane crash by taking one of these more, apparently more distant frames. Um, one of the things that I think we're gonna discover, those people who are going with me to Spain, I mean, we've got different partners who have been, you've got Woodrow First School, and you've also got a school in Spain who've been busy doing rolling roll projects and discovering about it. Um, I'm, I'm interested in what happens with the school in Spain because they've got a lot of teachers who've got very excited and very involved, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure yet if they are really understanding what's involved. For example, in frame, I'm not sure if they understand frame or understand frame distance. I think it's a good idea, a good exercise to ask people to define what is the frame that you're gonna use and what is the frame distance, which is why I like that form, that chart that we looked at. So as I say, I'm not sure in this chart if they are all participants, because if they're a personnel department who are responsible for job descriptions, maybe they are more of an um, agent rather than a participant because they're not actually doing the job anyway and job center workers again agents perhaps villagers who are applying for jobs that you'd say that is i think you'd say that is participant but again you've got the personnel department selecting and interviewing the candidates i think there's more of a I wouldn't put, I wouldn't myself call them participants in the event. Depends what you mean by the event, David, really. Yeah, I, I think mean, it's, I, you know, go on. Yeah. Well, they're not actually doing the interviews. Right, that's what you mean, okay. I think that's really, if you've got, okay, selecting and interviewing the candidates. Well, in that case, what she's, this, teachers talked about is okay we're going to be interviewing the candidates um which would put you in a drama situation of the event of the conversation the dialogue in the interview if we look at what dorothy does she doesn't do that in her plan in her mind she doesn't do that kind of they don't do the interviews they prepare for the interviews in which case they're more the they could be the agent they could be the authority maybe you could see them in those terms 
David, can I just just throw in something there now, very quickly? If you go back to the frame distance, you know, it seems to me that I suppose I'm only going to say this quickly because it's just John and Doug, but in terms of research methods. So if you take it, we say observation as a research method, then um, that might be a guide or a witness. Or if you take looking at children's examples of work, that might be research. I'm just saying that there's possibilities for explaining research methods yeah. by looking at the frame distance. Because, for example, I'm interested in a visual metaphor and I'm looking at the frame distance here that Dorothy Hethcote has written. And it seems to me that you can justify the visual metaphor by saying that I have, I am adopting the, is the perspective or the frame of an artist. I'm only adding that in now because I just happen to be doing it at the moment and it resonates with me. Yeah, I think so, Helen, because I think each of these frames, it's, it's, you position the children differently and it creates a different kind of language and it kind of creates a different kind of knowing about the event. If you're talking as um, guides, it's very different from talking as an artist or as a researcher. So that I think is part of the whole business of, of having a frame distance. Yeah. It's, it's the, the way you see, the way you see the event, the way you approach the event, the way you're coming at it. Yeah. So this is Challoner Hall. And they also had a ground floor plan. And then, so in this particular strand of work, this is how it started. So you've got a message, a memo, that's going to this group of people who are within the personnel department that's working to create this hotel. And you've got a message from the desk of Dorothy uh, and in the office of management. And it says, management require a realistic projection of staff required in running the hotel at full strength. Please supply details of all departments which will require staff, e.g. cleaning, security, shop franchises, hairdressing, balloting, etc. Two, approximate numbers of staff um, needed for each department, section, service, and three, suggestions regarding the placing of advertisements, newspapers, magazines, trade publications, e.g. the caterer, and ideas for styles in language and format. P.S. Pull your fingers out, they're panicking, D. <laughs> so the little human touch at the end of it there. So there's quite a lot packed, a lot packed into that, that one memo. And it seems to me, I've had some discussions with Claire about, uh, suddenly I started to think about, okay, in rolling roll, do you have a client? Because of course, we're so used to working mantle and in mantle, you've always got a client. And so is there a client in rolling roll? And if there isn't a client, which becomes the focus, then what is in there instead? And I know that in Woodrow, and I've had conversations with Lisa from Woodrow about this as well, they've had, they've been doing rolling roll and they've each, they've been expert teams. Uh, each class has been an expert team and they've had a client. And I think, as I've been saying to Lisa, the danger possibly in that is that the focus, each team has its own focus, they're focused on the client. Whereas with rolling roll, everybody's really got to be focused on the same thing, really. They've got to be brought together. So the focus really, I guess, is on the point of change. That's what brings everyone together. But the, the client becomes such a mechanism within Mantle for the work that you're doing. And it seems to me that at least one of the elements that is used uh, is this, it's the memo. 
this is what Dorothy uses here anyway, to get the work started. So it's not teacher saying, let's do this. Uh, you, I want you to do this today. It's this memo arrives, which is the equivalent um, in a way of the, the client letter in Mantle. Um, it's not quite the same thing, but it works here to sort of get the work going and to set out what the work needs, what work needs to be done. So one of the things they have to do, obviously, is decode this letter to begin with. If we look at that plan again, that planning chart, you can see that it seems like all of that work from that memo was done by one class. You've got memos concerned, the, they looked at the um, memo and they produced the material, the information that then went to the job center workers. Dorothy, as I said, had a more, she wanted to see done with more rigor, I think, than that suggests, because that was one of, always one of Dorothy's big things, of course, doing things with rigor. It was this thing about, um, she liked to quote William Blake, didn't she? If you would do good to somebody, you must do it in minute particulars. So she had this thoroughness that she wanted put into something. And so this would not be, she stresses in the videos with Claire when she's talking about this, that anything like this should not become just a form filling exercise. She talks in these videos about how um, teachers have this thing about wanting to get things done. You know, you want to get it filled out. You give them a form or something and you give them a time to, to fill it in with as much information as possible. But Dorothy, it's got to be much more detailed than that. So she actually breaks this down, this memo, into four sections, four different tasks. And each one would take at least a lesson, I think, is her idea. So one of them is deciding who would be needed for running this hotel. The second one is how many do we need? That's a different task. The third one is suggestions for where the advert should go. And the fourth one is the style of language and the format for the advert. So she's really breaking that down. And she then has suggestions for how these, this might roll on to other groups. So this is something that we found in the archive. This is her plan for this whole section of work. And she, she fixes here on an, the A route, what she calls the A route. So the, the job center, the information about the, the kinds of staff that are needed and the numbers, this will go to a group working for the idea of the focus of the job center. And this is her outline of what those different tasks are. So when you're looking at um, deciding what staff will be needed, that itself is a task that demands you have to decode the content of the memo. You have to identify and select appropriate tasks to be done in the hotel, in running the hotel. You have to summon the images and the experiences and the memory. In your memory, you have to think about what jobs will be done in a hotel like that. You have to kind of picture it, I think, is what she's suggesting. You have to name and identify the work processes. So what does a cleaner do, for example? What does a um, valet do, and so on? You have to consider the size of the workforce. So for her, it's not simply a question of, um, okay, we, we need um, 10 cleaners or whatever. There's got to be an, she wants the children to picture what they would be doing, what these different staff would be doing. As I say, the second group B is deciding the numbers for each section. The third group is considering the appropriate outlets for the advertis advertisements. And then the other group is providing examples of language for the advertisements. So those four tasks. So here we have 
after the um, group has produced, um, made decisions about the jobs that are needed, there's another memo that goes with the materials to the next group, to the job center personnel. So that's your next group, people running the job center. And this memo again comes from Dorothy as secretary of this Chalana Hall group. Chalana Hall will shortly be interviewing applicants for the following positions and the management requests that job cards are placed in your center's window to inform possible applicants. For, on behalf of the management of Chalana Hall, many thanks, Dorothy Hethcote, secretary. So all of the information that's been produced by the first group, where they've outlined what they think of the jobs, this all goes to the next group who have got this memo going with it. Is that all clear so far? Is it making sense to you how this is working? Yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, cool. So then, Dorothy actually sees this possibly happening. She talks about it in the video with Claire, of it happening with possibly with a special needs group, or she thinks of it also, it could be happening with a, uh, an ordinary class. Um, so they have to decode the cards, this information that they've got. So again, there's an exercise at the start in terms of decoding. So they have to interpret the memo, they have to interpret the information they've been given. So they are looking at these cards that they've been sent about the different jobs. And this is the information about the special needs group where there's, a, the, there's an emphasis on creating the window, creating the window in the job center and, and arranging these jobs somehow by some classification method. She also gets them into considering how to help people who might be looking in through the window, how to go and talk to them about jobs they might be interested in. And it also says, if possible, create guidelines for job center personnel on how to talk to clients, I think is the idea. And here's the model job card that she produced that they would fill in. So you've got the name of the job available at Chalana Hall Hotel, the address, the telephone number, the skills required for the job. And then applicants age 16 plus, 21 plus, or any age up to, so what would be the maximum age for this particular position? So when you, there's some notes from this JARO 3 about this project. And when they talk about the work that is done on this particular strand, this particular domain, I think most, if not all of the classes were English classes. And they talk about it as being sort of typical kind of comprehension and writing tasks that you might get in any kind of English class. Um, but it's within a context. So the difference that they see is that you've got these tasks, which are, which are typical tasks in an English classroom, but they are put in this context of working on the hotel on within the village and that changes it but when you hear Dorothy talking about it I think she she was really keen to avoid as I've said the kids getting a form like this and just filling it in with anything she really wants them to get down to um, the nitty-gritty the detail of jobs so she's looking at, if you're a cleaner in a hotel, what are the skills that are required? And you've got to picture it and you've got to think it through really in clearly what are the skills involved? And she, she talks on the video about how in any job, what she might do with a group working on this is to do a job or perform an action in front of them, like, breaking an egg to make a cake or something like that and saying to them when I do this break down the skill that is involved in doing that task break it down into detail what are all the amazing skills that are involved in a simple task like that 
And she talks about how she really wants to get people to a position where they would be paying attention to people around them that they see in the jobs that they you see people doing and what are the skills involved in that so it's much more than a simple task of writing down a few skills that you need it's actually trying to penetrate she wants the children i think in this to penetrate the kind of skills that people have in jobs because i think this really was one of her drives as a teacher you know she talked about the she misquotes Dylan Thomas a lot, where she says, um, the undertaker measures with his eyes the passers-by for shrouds. The idea is that when you've got a job, then it conditions the way you see things. So you see the world like an undertaker would look at people and would immediately be measuring them for the kind of shrouds they would need, the kind of coffin they would need. And um, this is... As I say, it's a misquote from Dylan Thomas. Dylan Thomas actually said something a bit different than that. Although I actually like Dorothy's version better, I think, than Dylan Thomas's version. I think it's quite funny that Dorothy misquotes somebody but puts it into kind of quite a poetic form. She creates a kind of poetic line. Because I like this line, the undertaker measures with his eyes the passers by for shroud. She's got a kind of poetic rhythm going on in that. Um, but I think that was one of the, her things. I think this is there in, in Mantle of the Expert. When you set up a frame, whenever you set up a frame uh, where people are coming to it from a particular kind of job angle, she's concerned with that thing about um, how people see things. That's part of the way of building the frame, I think, is about how people see the world through their eyes. And it's building that idea in people. Um, and then people do that, you know, because I, I remember going into a, a shop in Birmingham, which was a, a clothes shop, and I wanted some shirts. And the guy looked at me and said, uh, I, so you, I think, would need a 15 and a half collar size, wouldn't you? And I was sort of, I hadn't said anything. Immediately, he could look at my uh, me and decide what my size of shirt would be, because obviously he sees things in a particular way through his job. Um, I think that's why Dorothy liked these kind of more sort of craft jobs where there was a craft involved, because then really it is a case of that becomes part of you. Like um, my local in my local shopping centre, there's lots of just supermarkets and um, Poundland and all that, and the people in there are simply salespeople. But you've also got one shop which is a tailor's where I'm sure that the guy who works there is, it does exactly what Dorothy says. He looks at somebody and immediately knows what kind of size of shirt they would need, or they'd be looking at the clothes they're wearing and thinking what adjustments should be made to that clothes, those clothes to look, make it better. And so that's part of her work, her way of working. It's really, it's, if, it's really sort of any kind of mantle frame, I think, is should have that in it that kind of how do people look how do people see the world how does the jobs they do the tasks they do the skills they have how does that shape the way they look at the world and when i look at this strand of work that she's setting up here this um cr choosing jobs for the hotel and trying to visualize the jobs that people do and define and break down the skills and be aware of the skills that people need in simple things. Like she talks about in the video with Claire, she talks about um, a shop assistant in a shoe shop and how they get the shoes out of the box. And that itself, she says, there's a skill in that. There's an art in that. If you start to break it down and really look at the, what they do. Um, and what seems interesting to me here she's asking the children in deciding on the jobs for the hall in writing the job cards to actually look at it look at jobs and break it down like this look have an outside eye to understand frame is really what she seems to be doing here and i was thinking about this business of the tension point what is the tension point in this strand of work 
you can see a clear tension point when you've got the skeleton. But what's the tension point here? And I don't know if it really is, if it counts as a tension point or not, but she was talking so much about this business of, of the job and the skills of the job, that this seems to be what is really coming through as the thing that she would be pressing for in the whole thing, that we're not just filling out forms, that we're really trying to understand the jobs that people do, the skills that people have, and try to inhabit that to some degree anyway. If we're talking about, okay, what is a cleaner? Trying to really understand or picture and visualize what is involved in that frame. In some ways, asking them to look at it in the same way she looks at it when she's thinking of, of frames of, of jobs that people do. I don't know if that is, I don't know if that really counts as a point of tension. I don't know, but that does seem to be the drive behind it. I can't quite see what another point of tension is, apart from the obvious things about the panicking, we've got to do this quick, we've got a deadline to meet, and that sort of thing. So this is her plan for this section. You've got the this or these alternative routes from the information that was produced first of all which is the, what the jobs are you've got it going to this special needs class to decode the cards and create the job center window you've also got it going to other groups the next for the next stage of the drama so you've got a group which is preparing for the interviews now this group she says here, she stresses, note, this is not an interview drama. It seemed like in the, um, the chart that I showed you that it was an interview drama, that it was going to be set up as, okay, we're going to be doing the interviews and you have some people making job applications. And so the, it's an obvious thing that you could do in drama, um, which would be to have the actual interviews, to have people come along and be interviewed for the jobs and she doesn't want that it seems like that's what they did and what sort of the teachers did but she doesn't want that she says instead and i think these are kind of significant shifts that she makes she gets away from the obvious which is the interview drama she says the class should be involved in considering the space in the venue for these interviews the signs that are in the space. Questioning skills for interviewing people, reading people, how you read people for signs, for um, body language, I suppose. <laughs> how you decipher their responses. And what she suggests is a result is a series of still images with explanatory labeling to help the personnel department develop skills in selecting these those best fitted for each position. So I have my own thoughts on what she's doing here. I don't know if anyone's got any comment on this, that she's not saying it's an interview drama. It's she's asking for something else from them. Anyone got any observations on this? I suppose it's really interesting that it's really, um, detailed and broken down so well. Mm. I suppose this group would be sending, I'm just imagining, would they, I was thinking in my head, they'd be sending images um, of the still images in photographic form or something with details onto the next group, could they, or drawings or something. I'm just it thinking, looks... you know, that, that might be a way of them, them receiving it. Is that, is that right? I don't know. Looks like it. She's saying what they do is they look at all this and then they create still images and they label them. Yeah. It's to help the personality department not just decide who should get the job. Decide for the skills, isn't it? Is what it? skills are involved in selecting the best people for a job? Yeah. I think that's really, really interesting. And yeah, that's how I would think about using it to. to for some part, reason. Yeah, Iona, for some reason I'm remembering um, working um, or observing you one time with a group of A-level students and that they were setting up a, a recruitment agency and it was all about this, about setting up the signs mm -hmm. and 
setting up the skills rather than the actual interview itself. Do you remember that? No, but okay. you know, but I do remember. This reminds me very much. I don't know about you, David, but it reminds me a little bit of what we did with the What's in Store drama. I know it wasn't a rolling role, but it was about jobs and finding people to volunteer for the store. Yes, and, that's right. Yeah. And it's very similar, I, th I think, in some respects. Mm. Um, you know, because they were they were thinking about what was needed and what they were looking for, and they were interrogating text and applications. Um, so they were doing similar sort of things, but this is more about this is going to be passed on to the department. It's almost like the the departments that are broken down are broken down according to the skills that she's broken down, if you know what I mean. It's kind of representing each chunk of the process. Yeah. That, that's the way I, I, I'm getting it anyway. Yeah. Mm. You mean she's thinking of what skills are needed at each stage of it? Yes, at each stage. And it's almost like each group or class are taking on a stage of it. Yeah. Because that's what's happening. It's not one class doing all stages. It's this class doing this very detailed stage with yeah. great, in great depth. And then passing their expertise of what they've done on to the other group, who then say, "Ah, right. So this is what we've got to be you know, looking for, and let's see if we can work out the skills from these diagrams and these notes." And you know, I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I guess it, it gives a lot of depth to the work, rolling roll, doesn't it? And a lot of detail because it's so broken down. Is what I'm getting from this, you know. Mm. Well, I think if it was, if they'd simply gone, for, hello, Vaishali, you've got your hand up. I didn't know you were there, Vaishali, so it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Yes, David, I mean, I'll, I'll ask the question once you finish. No, carry on. <laughs> okay, all right. No, I was wondering if we could also try this in the same um, class. Uh, and if we can time it in a way so that it rolls. Um, yeah. Has this been tried out in a classroom setting? I just wanted to know that. In yeah. India, it's possible we have over 40 children in a class. So, so if you're, um, I think, are you saying that these different stages, so you have going from the job center to um, yeah. well, going from the personnel department to the job center, and now this seems this is the personnel department. I think, isn't it setting up? No, it's the job center. But they are choosing how to set up the interviews. Okay, so are you yeah. saying that one group might change its frame? A different to no. different yeah. work that way. No, that way it's possible, definitely. But if what if uh, the forty students are divided into four? groups of oh, 10 children each and we time it in a way that by the time the first group finishes the second group is ready and the first group i'm just thinking yeah, no. I, I think yeah <laughs> I do. the thing is it's always one of the issues about roll and roll is just the timing of it isn't it claire it's kind of yeah. you, you produce work and then it has to be ready to go on to the next group absolutely yeah really work intensive so that might be the yes. issue there by Charlene in terms of just rolling the work on. Um, I think that this, Claire said, I think you seem to remember that this project took, was uh, only had a week. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, and that's why when you look at what the students have put about the frames and Dorothy making them much deeper, yeah. I mean, my sympathy is with the teachers. They've only got a week and it's totally new to them. So yeah. it never likely to be more superficial than she would like, really. I well, you can see that, yeah, because you can see that what the teachers are doing, they've got a full timetable and they are going from class to class to class. And each class, it seems, it was probably like, OK, they've got to be job centre workers and they've got an hour to be job centre workers and to do these cards. Mm -hmm. But she can see that you would, she, ideally, you would spend much longer with each section of this work, of each sort of, like this, the interview drama, you could spend quite a lot of time, quite a number of sessions just looking at this, couldn't you? Yeah, I mean, that's right. really looking at the people, the applicants really, isn't it? Look, looking at their point of view about the space and the, you know, that's probably nothing that, well, I certainly wouldn't have given time to. I wouldn't have had time to do that. Yeah. Mm. 
Right. But it's a case of, you know, for Dorothy, I guess she would say, well, this is, you really have to go into this kind of depth. Yeah, you do have to, but yeah. it's very difficult within a very busy school to do it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. Because this is a whole thing about not just let's prepare the interviews and do the interviews. This is about how do you do a good job in interviewing? And you can go into all this detail and prepare, not just go into, okay, how is the best done, but then prepare models for other people, showing them with images, showing them how it's best done. So that could be quite a sort of several sessions at least to go through that and prepare that and to come out in the end. Yeah. But it seems to me that what she's doing, okay, if, you, if they just had the interviews, if they just did the interviews, then the case, it would be, I don't know, maybe it would just end up being a bit of a game. Okay, let's see who are the best people and then it's just yeah. a different job or not. But yeah. she wants them to be more conscious, it seems to me, of, of what makes, um, of how you choose the best candidates. You've got to have that kind of self-spectator in the head, watching the whole thing and looking and thinking about what is the best way to set up the space for an interview? What kind of signs should we look at for people who are being interviewed. Let's make some recommendations of that, which seems to me a way of realizing them, realizing their knowledge, realizing their understanding of the whole process of interviewing people. And something similar happens when you look at um, this bit, which is about writing letters of application for the jobs. So in the original chart, it looks like they had villagers who were writing letters of application. Dorothy's way of doing it is different. I mean, the idea of writing letters of application, there's a note again from this Jarrow 3 where they say um, oh, people who, the children doing this would have learned something about how to write a good job application letter, which I kind of think there's a danger there that what you're doing is more like a kind of simulation role play exercise where people are learning about how to how to present themselves as good job applicants. You know, you, you do get people doing dramas like that. And Dorothy certainly wants to avoid that because she's saying not, OK, right, be a villager and write a letter. She's saying, I think, again, these could be people working in a job centre who create models of applications to be placed in the job center for clients to look at. So they, they, she breaks this down into stages. She says, stage one, create drafts of the letters. And then stage two is they examine these drafts. They annotate them. They make suggestions. Presumably they pass them to other people. The third stage is they produce final drafts. And then the fourth stage is they annotate these final drafts. They put comments on them. They draw attention to certain things. They analyze the whole application letter. So these then don't go to the hotel to apply for jobs. They go to, the, to be placed in the job center so that people who are, might want to apply for a caterer's job or a cleaner's job in the job center can look at these model letters can look at them and see what how they might write a letter to a job center or to the um, hotel rather to apply for one of these jobs they're creating model letters again it's a different stage or a different way of approaching it not write the letter of application but write a model letter that other people could look at as a model so again, there's that, just as with the earlier um, thing we talked about, where they are, this one, where they are, uh, it's not an interview drama. Here, they're not simply writing letters. They are thinking about and making recommendations to other people about what makes a good letter of application. So within that, they would be learning these skills about writing letters for themselves, but it wouldn't be kind of instrumental in simple way of just, OK, how you learn to be um, to present yourself well in an interview or write a good letter. They are they are reflecting on the whole thing. They are looking at the whole process of 
of drafting and writing a letter and, and how that should be set out. They are becoming more reflective. Their, their self spectator, I guess, is more aware through this way of working of what is good. They're analyzing that. So that seems to be the difference. And I also think that it's what she said before that, you know, um, the best way of learning is to teach someone else. So as she, in a sense, that's what they're doing here, aren't they? They, they are teaching someone else because they're preparing the next group to look at the skills involved and to, to set things out. So I think that that ultimately will make them pretty good at writing letters and preparing for interviews themselves. Yeah. You know, so I think otherwise, if you do it the other way, you're just having something imposed on you and you're copying what somebody asked you to do. So you're not reflecting, you're not thinking it through, and you're not looking at, at implications, which was a huge dimension of her work. The implications of what they do, um, you know, is so important. And I think this is what this learning process here is doing. Mm. I think it's a great lesson in preparing for interviews themselves, even though it's very distant from, from them. And because it's very distant from them. Well, if you're, a, if you're applying for a job, if you're put in that position, then you're in a weak position, really, aren't you? Because you're somebody, oh, I need something. I need to, I need to try and present myself as best. Whereas here, what she's giving them is an expertise. We are the authorities on this. Yeah, absolutely. It's very different. We can advise other people on this. Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And that's mm. the shift. Mm. That's the difference. It's a different positioning of the children, isn't it, really? Of the participants, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So you start with them with an expertise, an expert position, which gives them the power to, to act or to... Mm. It gives them the authority. Yeah, it's very rich, isn't it? It is, yeah. And yet it's sort of based in quite a sort of simple shift, and yet it so, has so many consequences to put them in this different position mm. to approach the, what looks like a similar task anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> a bit like when we did, um, we were doing a project once, Yona was involved and Jill Adamson, mm. and we were asked to do a project for young people in year six, in England going from primary school to secondary school. So it was, it's called transition, transition year, and how they make that leap and the, the challenges they face in making that leap. And we went to Dorothy to get her suggestion for it. And she suggested we put them in the frame of life coaches. So the children, would be advising people who want to make a change in their lives um, but maybe face obstacles in doing that so there's that um that was just that brilliant sh switch again she's giving them the expertise they're not they're not people who need help in making the transition they are people who are preparing other people to make a change in their lives and of course in doing that they would get some idea about the challenges they are facing themselves in making a transition and a change but they're doing it through this position first of all of being experts in helping others and not being helped and I'm sure that often kids are put in that position of the ones who need help especially if they're special needs yeah <laughs> yeah that tends to happen yeah yeah, yeah. so here is a sort of breakdown of how this would all strand of work would work in her model. So A, this strand goes to the job center and B, they all go to the job center, but could be worked on by different groups. So there was also C, if you remember, which was suggestions for the magazines or outlets where the adverts would appear for these jobs. So C goes to personnel. And D will go to graphics and publicity to draft the adverts. So that's all again, tasks really being broken down in detail again. And again, I think for adverts, you'd be looking at, okay, not just a design task, I imagine. We don't have detail for these, um, but I, it wouldn't just be a designing task. It would be a thinking about, again, probably thinking about the job, the job that's involved. And how do we break that down? How do we explain that? How do we present it? 
to people. So that's this strand in Dorothy's model. This is the third strand, the third chart, which is all about the tales, the folk tales, the legends, the stories that villagers have about Chalana Hall. Um, and as we said, this seems to have taken a week of work. Um, and what you've got, it seems to me, that there are these three strands that we've looked at. So that's the skeleton, and the hotel, and this strand, which is the, the folk tales and legends. These seem to have been autonomous, separate. So although they've got the same context, which is Morick Village, I don't see from looking at these charts that work was being passed from the skeleton group, for example, to the to this group or this strand. I don't think there was an overlap. It looks to me like each teacher, each of these three teachers took one strand and the work rolled within that one strand and it didn't overlap to another strand, if that makes sense. It seems to me that, and you can imagine that that made sense for them in terms of their planning, that they, they kept within their own domain. One teacher was in charge of the skeleton domain and the work was rolling within that domain. It wasn't going from um, to another domain. And I really wanted to, so this is not sort of a, a perfect model. This is a model of how it worked. You know, there's different models, I think, for the way that roll and roll could work in a school. Um, and Claire, I was wondering really about, okay, so you had, when you were talking about the, the project with the, um, the teachers, the art teacher and the history teacher, and the art teacher was focused on the fresco. There was a strand which is all about a fresco that had been discovered and that was in fragments. And the history teacher had got a document which was a sort of legend, which had, when you looked at this old document and legend, it had information in it which was about uh, Anglo-Saxon or medieval life. And you were looking at the, um, the strand about the library and the moving of the library from one place to another. And you had the builders and you had the librarians. And so you had several classes involved in that. So you've got three strands in that project or three domains. Was there a case of was work rolling from one group or from your domain, from the library domain to another domain? Or were they fairly sort of self-contained, these three strands? How did that work? No, they, <clears throat> they started off as self-contained, but they did actually go into, certainly I remember them going into the history department, uh, some of the work that was produced in the library, you know, some of the books, they're sorting the books um, on, on historical things would have been sent to the history teacher for their opinion on stuff. That's, that's the sort of level it was done at. Okay. Because there is that complexity, isn't there? And you can see why they might be that it um, makes sense to keep things sort of clear in sort of different strands. But you could also see that there could be overlap because certainly here, the people making the discoveries about the skeleton and the stories involved with that skeleton could obviously feed into this strand, which is about local tales and legends. And they're producing, some people here are producing... Um, a handbook about Morick Village, and so it would all go into that. You know, as I was saying, I think there's, there's another point of change here, which is not just the hotel becoming, the whole becoming a hotel, but it's about the discovery of that skeleton and the stories around it. That's a kind of strong tension point, I think. The other thing is that all of the work is published. So whatever one class is producing, you have to publish it. And the other teachers might think, oh, there's something I could use there. You don't keep it, even though you might be just concentrating on one, uh, what you call it, uh, you don't hang on to that work. Whatever the uh, kids do, you have to put it out in some form. Yeah. That's the big difference with Roll and Roll. It, they don't own the work. So all of this material, if it is displayed in some central area, the kids are seeing it and could obviously be picking up on things that other people are doing as well. Yeah. And the teachers will pick up on stuff as well. So that is Morick Village, 
any sort of other comments or observations on that or questions about it or how it worked i do think the complexity of it is one of the issues that people have with roll and roll and the the, the way they have to work together and plan together this was obviously planned very tight in terms of you maybe only had one session or two sessions with a group and they had to produce work that rolled to another group. Um, it seems to me that by and large, a class might um, only take on one frame uh, for one particular task in this model. So the team who are the job cards, job centre, are producing the job cards, arranging them, that is their contribution to the whole project um there were some cases where a class might be taught um might be taking on a role like doing the job center and then later on they might be taking another role um as villagers um and that happened in two or three cases just looking at the num the class numbers the class uh, which classes were involved it did happen that some people took different frames and did different tasks but that might have been by chance because of the way the the timetable worked and who the teachers they were working with any final thoughts from anyone i think really for for this to work you know um i think dorothy was very interested probably in revolutionizing schooling and in a way this rolling role was a response to the segregation of classes, wasn't it, in secondary schools. It was a way of bringing them together, but she's still having to grapple. It's like Claire says, really, the limited time a teacher has. You know, she's still having to grapple with those things, really. Ideally, it'd be nice if secondary schools were different. <laughs> the time was distributed differently, and there was more time to do this properly, you know, in an ideal world. Mm. Um, but also, of, of course, um, it may be that it's more, it could be more productive in primary for that reason. Maybe there's some flexibility, even though there's, it's a new curriculum now, which is a bit tighter. But I'm thinking of like a culture in Wales where it's much freed up. It seems to be a, a more fertile ground to be able to do this, you know. That was my own personal thought about it. Mm. I think she also just wanted teachers to be talking together and working together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And not in their subject silos. That's right. Absolutely. And yet it, it kind of goes against the grain that secondary schools are, you know, compartmentalising all these things. So it's kind of difficult. I think it's a difficult challenge mm. in the current culture of schooling that we have in secondary schools. I also feel that, yeah, sorry. I also feel that the, the amount of um, course content has gone up uh, immensely from what uh, we would study in year 10 is almost double, you know, now, 20 years later. So I think um, it's dearth of time was always there, but it's even, <laughs> is there, uh, you know, even more right now. Uh, so doing this, I think it, it can help if, all the teachers look at it as a term project. That's what I feel. If all the teachers look at it as a term project, that third term we are only going to do rolling rolling roll. Mm -hmm. If that happens, probably this is possible. Yeah. I mean, I remember once. Um, I think it was when we were doing what's in store, David. I, I remember asking Dorothy um, the trouble with doing this work. Ms. Mantle, the expert then, but. Um, the teachers will say they have no time, you know, they will worry about time. And Dorothy said, said well, you need to ask them, what are, how are they using their time? What, what are they using their time for? You know, how is their time being used? And that wasn't meant to be an arrogant statement or anything. It was just a very good question, really, isn't it? About you say there's a lot of extra content. I, I agree. Oh, yes. Right, mm. But then you've got to ask yourself. Um, so there's yeah. more content. So does it mean they learn more content? I mean, I would argue that they probably don't learn more content. Yeah. They just yeah. learn more things superficially than they did before. So I think it's a good question of how do we use our time so that these young people can become proactive learners, really, themselves. That's what I think, you know, is a question we need to always ask ourselves, really. Yeah. 
I know it's easy to say when you're not in a school now, but you, you reflect and you realise you, you can't you can't learn all that content in anything apart from a superficial form. But I know the it's point important. is yeah. The point is every teacher has to think about this question. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. I know, and it's they're in a difficult yeah. situation. <laughs> you know, it's a very difficult situation. I think to be in that yeah. that model of schooling. You know, it's very very hard. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, David, yeah. I think um, the, a lot of the resistance comes from teachers because they were taught themselves mm -hmm. in, you know, this way, tick box type of thing. I know I found it very difficult. But the other thing is, what happens in Roll and Roll, and it's really quite amazing, it generates enormous energy from the kids. It really does. When they see their work being connected to somebody else, that's the main thing and it, it, uh, the um the people the jarrow three they said they couldn't believe it you know the, the way the children reacted and i know in in woodrow the same thing happened there that they saw other people using their work and that that and the connections that it, you know children realize you know outside of maths or you know simple box things i think that that's what's on offer it in roll and roll, but it's very difficult to do. But once you have a go at it and broken your leg over the boxes and things like that, you know, uh, it's it's tremendous, really is. Yeah, I think one of the things in terms of this time question, one of the things that, I mean, that video with you, Claire, it's episode ten is really good. I think, and it's mostly focused or all focused on this Morick Village project. But the whole thrust of it is. Uh, this this desire that teachers have to to get things done to say fill this in fill 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 do it do do it yeah. and yeah. just keep doing it and that and she's is doing a, offering a different model really and um teachers might resist it on that basis of saying well it looks like you're asking us to do lots more we haven't got time for all this but she's actually saying it's a different model it's saying you've got to stop really just doing things, just trying to fill things in and get them completed, you've got to be able to take them into this kind of depth of work. It is a different model. And I know that it, uh, teachers are being pulled a different way. Um, but it just that get it done sound of system is not really benefiting the children in the end, she's saying. Uh, David, I would say that as a teacher, a primary school teacher myself, that looking at the materials that you showed us, especially the drawings and Dorothy's beautiful handwriting itself, that's quite motivating. Motivating. Motivating, yeah. There's a lot of work that she did. Well, incredible amount of work she did in terms of planning stuff. When you look at these documents in the archive, and the materials that were produced. There's, I'm looking at the moment, Claire, at these videos of um, Dorothy working in your school when she came for a, a week and she did the Beast and Boilers, the, the brewery explosion and all that. And every time, every day, there's a whole new setup and all materials that were produced for them to work from. Um, there was a lot of work that she did, incredible amount of work in preparation. Um, but a lot of the teaching went through those materials you know, great materials when you look at them, all the things you produce. And there's a lot more of, a lot more materials um, for Morick Village. And I don't know how they were used exactly, some of them. Like there was a whole sort of, there was a family tree for the Chaloner family. There was a whole historical account of the Chaloner family and so on. Great materials that were produced. It would be interesting to know how to get, we'll say for example, her beautiful handwriting, and those diagrams, how can you reconstitute them into resources for a teacher? Like, would you go about doing that? I think, you know, I've put some of these resources online and the idea is, okay, looking at what Dorothy did, but then it becomes an opportunity for other people to use them as they see fit. And in fact, um, Bob Seldeslavs in Belgium has done a project using Morick Village materials. I mean, he reinvented it for the Belgian context. But I think it's great if people start doing that. 
taking these materials and using them themselves. Yeah. It's interesting you say you like Dorothy's handwriting because a lot of people struggle with it, can't read. Yeah. Yeah. Just it's the attractiveness of the materials. Sorry, Claire. I'm just saying it is unique. As soon as you see it, you're like, oh, Dorothy, mm -hmm. I've got loads of stuff around. <laughs> it, it is definitely unique. And it's, I find it easy to read. I did, so, but we're used to it, I think, Claire. We yeah. were familiar with it <laughs> years, over all the years. Okay, so um, Roberta, are you, uh, Roberta, are you still awake? <laughs> there. <laughs> Yes, I'm still yeah. there. You're away. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't find time to look through it beforehand. No, no. Apart from the, from the from uh, the frame distancing bit. Uh, but I'm finding quite interesting how she uh how the, the, the teacher set it up and how she set it up because it looks like she was much more complex mm -hmm. than what the teachers could understand or take on on board for their classes. And and then it it looks to me that he ended be less, uh, more superficial than she wanted, but probably more in depth than the teachers uh, thought they were able to do. So is, is that sort of in the, in the middle of the way there? Um, and it's finding, it's connecting the time you've got, the, the children you have and the teachers you have, they have to be on the same, same I don't know, connection with, with the work. And I, I don't know, maybe she didn't have the time to, excuse me, to meet the teachers beforehand or to have a good discussion with them about how she were portraying all of that. Uh, so many things that could vary. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting to see and to think more about the, the time we have, the, the group we're working with and the teachers we have to deliver the work with us. And I think, you know, the danger with that kind of, like the job card form and the tasks that were in that, strand the danger would be simply that it would become like conventional exercises of here's the form fill it in and it's that extra dimension that she wanted put in it which is about really looking at the skills that people have that seems to me to change it to a whole different level rather than simply form filling which it seems like maybe that was the way that teachers were doing it maybe at least from the comments that they made about it. it's it's like the sort of comprehension exercises or writing exercises you get in English. She really wanted to get beyond that or uh, to yeah. make it much deeper than that and richer than that. In the library, uh, in my role in role, uh, we had about 300 cards which were meant to represent the books. My husband was driven mad writing this, uh, but uh, some of them were quite difficult titles, you know, and, and that really stretched them. They couldn't just put them anywhere, you know, they had to really look and think, well, what might it be about then, you know, so it, it, it was more in-depth than they would normally do. Yeah, yeah, certainly. <laughs>